Seeing God in Biology. Uh, back in the 60s, when I was in college, I was a philosophy major. And uh, I took a philosophy religion class, and of course, we were reading atheistic authors. Uh, one of them happened to be a man named Anthony Flew. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, he was an atheist at the time, but it, several years ago, maybe five, six years ago, in his 80s, he suddenly came out and declared himself to be a deist. He came to believe that there is a God in the universe. And what I'm going to show you tonight is why that change took place. We have a scripture in Romans. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. This, this is actually, when you look about invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature, clearly seen through what has been made. And, and I, I'm here to tell you that as science has continued to explore the biology, things in biology and the astronomy and those things, the fact that there is a God out there becomes increasingly clear. Um, I put this study together actually for my Sunday school class. Uh, for those of you who are interested, on 8.30 on Sunday mornings, I'm going to the book of Isaiah verse by verse, and it's available on Facebook Live. So if you um, go to Facebook and you search on Don Curtis, uh, Isaiah, uh, it'll pop up. Um, but anyway, a couple of weeks ago I was uh, in Isaiah 44, and Isaiah's parable of a log has to do with someone who cuts down a tree and begins to use the tree for various things, uh, one of which is to make an idol from it. And this parable concludes like this. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it, the log. I've burned half the log in fire and also break bed, bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. And the, and the idea here is, how silly is that? Where you use the wood for so many things, and then finally you carve a figure on it, and it's a god, and you bow down, and you worship it? How silly is that? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Science claims there is no need for God. So we've gone from many gods to one God, and the atheists would say, well, let's just continue and go to no gods at all. And I don't know, when you, when you listen to news reports and things like that, they find water on Mars and they get all excited. Hey, we found water on Mars. Maybe there's life. Or, hey, we've, we've studied comets and there's organic compounds on a, on a comet. You know, can life be far from there, far away? And you get the idea that life is just a matter of just add water. Right? I mean, I mean, I mean, do, do, do you see how they, they just see that, well, life has to be easy to make, right? Well, yeah, a warm pond and some amino acids in a few million years, life happens. Um, I, have a, I was thinking about bringing a can of tuna fish here. So just imagine I'm holding a can of tuna fish. You know the interesting thing about a can of tuna fish? It has loads of amino acids and nucleotides and a whole bunch of chemicals that are needed for life. There is nothing closer to life than a can of tuna fish. <laughs> Certainly much more close than a warm pond full of amino acids. Here's, what, here's the deal. If I open this thing up in a, I, I work in a, uh, in a biology company and we have our sterile hood, so we know how to create a sterile field. So if I open this can of tuna fish in a sterile field, and I mix it in sterile water, and put it in a sterile Nalgene container, and I put it on a shaker, and we just let it slosh around for a million years. 
nothing is going to happen. The amino acids that are there are going to break apart. If it's exposed to sunlight, pretty soon it is just a slosh of nothing except some carbon. Okay. Uh, one of the founders of DNA, uh, Francis Crick, is famous for saying that he ha constantly has to remind his biology students that what they're looking at is, was never designed. It happened by chance. And he's warning his students, you have to remember this was not designed. Evolution <coughs> creates an illusion of design. OK. So I'm going to begin tonight with this. What's that? Anybody know? Morse code. What, what are the letters there? SOS, right? All right. Okay. Here's the deal. That dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot has two levels. It actually has two levels of code. One is that dot, dot, dot in Morse code is an S. And dash, dash, dash is an O. But SOS is itself a code. It is an international code for distress. I mean, you may not have known about the dot, 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 dash, and all that, but you certainly, if I would have said, hey, what's SOS about? You would have known, right? But the thing is, is notice how code represents information, right? This is, this is what code is all about. Code represents information. And my thesis tonight is that information always comes from intelligence, right? Information doesn't assemble itself randomly. At least codes for information do not assemble themselves randomly. So let's ponder the telegraph and Morse code. Okay. But what you see up there is a sender. You have a message, which, by the way, if, you, if, you're, if any of you are decoding it, it says, Jesus loves you. And then on the other side, you have a receiver. And then you have transmission lines in between. And, and notice that I put the Morse code table on both sides, because quite frankly, both sides need the same code, right? I mean, if, uh, if, if the code books are different on the inside, what, goes, what gets transmitted is loses. I mean, you, you just don't have it at the end. So Samuel F.B. Morse created the code. He created the code. It did not have to be what it is. Um, so he decided that a dot represented a short tap on the telegraph key. And a dash represented a longer uh, depression of the telegraph key. And then he said, so a combination of short and long, the Ds and the Das, represents my code. Um, he decided that a single dot would represent an E. Now, this actually was pretty smart because E is the most commonly used letter in English. So it just so happens that the shortest possible code represents an E. T happens to be the second most popular letter in the English language, and that is the dash, a single dash. And then it goes on from there. And actually, the shortest codes are reserved for the most frequently used letters. So he put some intelligence into the creation of his code. Um, so that, like I said, there's some design to the code for efficiency, but both the choice of the dot and the dash and letter combinations and are arbitrary. Nothing in the universe forced it to be this way. It's the nature of codes. So for a working telegraph, you need a sending device, a little tapper. You need a receiving device that is a little clicker on the other side. You need a means to transmit a sending action to the receiver. You need power. And you need the same code book on both sides. You take any one of these away, and you don't have a working telegraph. This is what's called irreducible complexity. 
You know, it's something that is either all there and working or it does not work. Okay? Just simple stuff, right? All right. So here is the working principle for tonight. You need a designer to create a code and make sure the equipment can translate it and that each side uses it. Okay, simple, basic stuff. Code represents information. It is not it's information in itself, it represents information. And information comes from intelligence. I'm, I'm going to be repeating myself over and over and over this morning, this, this evening. But in a little bit, you're going to see how profound this concept is. Codes are arbitrary. So uh, KFT, VT, MWPFT, ZPV, what does that say? It's a radio station. Could be a radio station. Um, I, I will tell you, information is there. Uh, if, and if you know the code, you can retrieve the information. I designed the code. Okay. It's a very simple substitution cipher. I just shifted each letter to the, to the right. So that K is a J, F is an E, T is an S, V is a U, T is an S. Jesus loves you. Okay? All right. Codes are arbitrary, but the information that they represent is real. Codes are arbitrary, the information that they represent is real. Okay. So, um, let's see, I guess. Okay. Now, language. Language is code where sounds communicate meaning. I mean, do you realize that we speak in code all the time? Jesus, right? That's a series of sounds that comes out of my mouth. But Jesus as information, Jesus as a concept, is world-changing. But it is a code that I speak. And not only that, but Jesus as a code can be pronounced Jesus, Jesus, Yesu, Yeshua, or it can be spelled in a different alphabet, like in Hebrew, which is the next one down is Yeshua in Hebrew. Right. Our letters for sounds that code for meaning and code requires intelligence in the creation, use, and understanding. Okay. So here's the thing. Again, codes are the product of intelligence. They're used to represent information, and intelligence is what is there to take a code and make some good use out of it. It all requires intelligence. Code transmission is the product of intelligence. Sending and receiving require the same codes. A is sent as a dot dash, dot dash is received and decoded as an A. And if you know something is a code, you can decode it. And codes are designed and require a designer. So I am going to introduce four videos that I'm going to show. Okay. Uh, the first video is going to be about DNA transcription. And by the way, these videos are produced by secular organizations. Okay, so they, it's not some Christian outfit that invented all this. this the, these videos come from Harvard. Okay. Um, DNA contains lengths of nucleotide codons. Uh, that code for amino acids, and the DNA section contains a sequence of amino acids that make a specific protein. This is what DNA is all about. It's all, it's all codes for proteins. Uh, these are copied to a long mo molecule called messenger RNA. So that's what we're going to see in the first video. The second video is called messenger RNA translation, where the messenger RNA is then used to assemble a series of amino acids into a protein. Um, I'm going to show DNA replication because this is the coolest video in biology that I think exists on the planet. Um, you know, they, DNA is self-replicating only in the sense that it, uses, it creates a bunch of proteins that are assembled together into this 
fancy little molecule that spins at 10,000 RPM so that it can be part of translating, of um, reproducing, copying DNA. And then I'm going to show you a music video because I like this one. This one is pretty. It's got, it's got a catchy tune. And it's just going to show you some of the other stuff that goes on in the cell. Um, all right. The players. DNA. DNA is a sequence of chemical codes. They're actually called nucleotides, and they're given letters, uh, uh, G, A, T, and C. And there are three letter combinations that code for amino acid. For example, TTT codes for phenylalanine. Alanine. You don't need to know it. You don't need to know this. I'm just showing you a little bit of what's, what's there. Um, the sequence is a code for a protein needed by the cell. But you know, there's these other sequences, like ATG in DNA represents a protein starts here. And then there's a code, TAA, which says the protein definition ends here. So there are start and stop codes all the way through our DNA. Um, a DNA strand is five feet long. This blows my mind. I mean, by the way, this is all microscopic, right? If you, you can't see a cell without a microscope, and the nucleus in the cell is a tiny little mini cell within the cell, and all the DNA is in that tiny little thing. We have, as humans, 42 strands of DNA, and they're all five feet long. 210 feet of information packed in every cell of your body. And that's how many codes we need to produce all the proteins that we need. Okay. All right. Messenger RNA is made in the cell and it's copied of, uh, a copy of the protein sequence and then transfer RNA. This is a tri triangular little molecule that at the tip has an amino acid attached. And at the base, it's got these little uh, molecule shape that actually match to the messenger RNA. They fit. And if there's a fit, we've coded for that particular amino acid. All right. So uh, before you start this, you need to remember that everything you're looking at is taking place in the cell. And these, I mean, this stuff that has been painstakingly put together over the last 60 years of just research and experimenting and things like that. But this is phenomenal. There's gonna be, they're gonna throw terms at you, forget the terms. Just sit back and admire, and I'm gonna say it here, just admire what God has put in us. Okay, so let's, let's go with uh, making messenger RNA. The central dogma of molecular biology, DNA makes RNA, makes protein. Here the process begins. Transcription factors assemble at a specific promoter region along the DNA. The length of DNA following the promoter is a gene, and it contains the recipe for a protein. A mediator protein complex arrives carrying the enzyme RNA polymerase. It maneuvers the RNA polymerase into place, inserting it with the help of other factors between the strands of the DNA double helix. The assembled collection of all these factors is referred to as the transcription initiation complex, and now it is ready to be activated. The initiation complex requires contact with activator proteins, which bind to specific sequences of DNA known as enhancer regions. These regions may be thousands of base pairs distant from the start of the gene. Contact between the activator proteins and the initiation complex releases the copying mechanism. The RNA polymerase unzips a small portion of the DNA helix, exposing the bases on each strand. Only one of the strands is copied. 
It acts as a template for the synthesis of an RNA molecule which is assembled one subunit at a time by matching the DNA letter code on the template strand. The subunits can be seen here entering the enzyme through its intake hole, and they are joined together to form the long messenger RNA chain snaking out of the top. Let's see. Well, that you may have to uh, tap out of it so I can get into the go to the, the next slide. Dog okay. The job of this. All right, there we go. Um, okay. Pretty amazing. You know, I mean, we have a code, and we have this chemical. Now they call it an enzyme, but you know, actually. When you look at everything that's going on and how it's moving along and unzipping things and collecting things and so forth, it really is a nanotechnology machine in the nucleus of the cell. All right. Now, with this video, we are going to continue following the messenger RNA as it makes a protein. The job of this mRNA is to carry the gene's message from the DNA out of the nucleus to a ribosome, for production of the particular protein that this gene codes for. There can be several million ribosomes in a typical eukaryotic cell. These complex catalytic machines use the mRNA copy of the genetic information to assemble amino acid building blocks into the three-dimensional proteins that are essential for life. Let's see how it works. The ribosome is composed of one large and one small subunit that assemble around the messenger RNA, which then passes through the ribosome like a computer tape. The amino acid building blocks, that's the small glowing red molecules, are carried into the ribosome attached to specific transfer RNAs. That's the larger green molecules also referred to as tRNA. The small subunit of the ribosome positions the mRNA so that it can be read in groups of three letters known as a codon. Each codon on the mRNA matches a corresponding anticodon on the base of a transfer RNA molecule. The larger subunit of the ribosome removes each amino acid and joins it onto the growing protein chain. As the mRNA is ratcheted through the ribosome, the mRNA sequence is translated into an amino acid sequence. There are three locations inside the ribosome, designated the A site, the P site, and the E site. The addition of each amino acid is a three-step cycle. First, the tRNA enters the ribosome at the A site and is tested for a codon-anticodon match with the mRNA. Next, provided there is a correct match, the tRNA is shifted to the P site and the amino acid it carries is added to the end of the amino acid chain. The mRNA is also ratcheted on three nucleotides or one codon. Thirdly, the spent tRNA is moved to the E site and then ejected from the ribosome to be recycled. As the protein synthesis proceeds, the finished chain emerges from the ribosome. It folds up into a precise shape determined by the exact order of amino acids. Thus, the central dogma explains how the four-letter DNA code is, quite literally, turned into flesh and blood. like a computer tape, ratcheted three at a time, you know, batching, extracting, a precise sequence for a protein that folds in a particular way because proteins very often are fully functioning by their shape more than anything else. But, but notice what we have here, a code in DNA that has information about a protein 
that is copied to messenger RNA that is sent outside of the nucleus that is connected to a ribosome with all these little transfer RNAs that match up code-wise so that we get the precise amino acid. Okay. You know, you need both sides. You know, both sides have to work. Both sides have the same code, have to have the same code, or you don't get useful proteins. All right? All right. Now, this one's just fun. Um, this is, like I said, this is the most amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, again, they're, they're going to call this one thing called helicase. It's a little they color it blue. Now, the, the, there's no real colors on this. They're color coding it for our, our benefit. Helicase is a protein complex that is a motor. And that motor spins at 10,000 RPM so that it can unravel five feet of DNA in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, what you're going to see is that after the DNA is unraveled, uh, there is a, a complex that creates a copy going off this way. I guess since you're going to be, it's going to go off this way. I don't know why it is, but the other side has to be copied backwards. So it's got to do some snipping and looping and things like that so that it is properly copied backwards. So, like I said, uh, this is... Um, the job of this mRNA... Okay, let's make a copy of the DNA so the cell can divide. During DNA replication, both strands of the double helix act as templates for the formation of new DNA molecules. Copying occurs at a localized region called the replication fork which is a Y-shaped structure where new DNA strands are synthesized by a multi-enzyme complex. Here, the DNA to be copied enters the complex from the left. One new strand is leaving at the top of frame, and the other new strand is leaving at the bottom. The first step in DNA replication is the separation of the two strands by an enzyme called helicase. This spins the incoming DNA to unravel it, at 10,000 RPM in the case of bacterial systems. The separated strands are called 3' prime and 5', prime, distinguished by the direction in which their component nucleotides join up. The 3' prime DNA strand, also known as the leading strand, is diverted to a DNA polymerase and is used as a continuous template for the synthesis of the first daughter DNA helix. The other half of the DNA double helix, known as the lagging strand, has the opposite orientation and consequently requires a more complicated copying mechanism. As it emerges from the helicase, the lagging strand is organized into sections called Okazaki fragments. These are then presented to a second DNA polymerase enzyme in the preferred 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. These sections are then effectively synthesized backwards. When the copying is complete, the finished section is released and the next loop is drawn back for replication. Intricate as this mechanism appears, numerous components have been deliberately left out to avoid complete confusion. The exposed strands of single DNA are covered by protective binding proteins, and in some systems, multiple Okazaki fragments may be present. So don't you love the comment? Significant things have been left out to avoid complete confusion. It is way more complicated than what this animation shows. Life, just add water. This had to be designed. It had to be made. It had to be manufactured. If DNA is the information repository in the cell, then this copying mechanism has to be there first, or the DNA has to be there first. Well, actually, it all has to be there at the same time. It's the only way that it works. 
You know, and therefore, when we look in the cell, as I say, we see God in this biology because it takes, I mean, I look at this. Uh, by the way, if you want details on this, there's a book about this thick called Signature in the Cell. It's by Stephen Meyer. I went into worship reading that book. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's my style, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I was... I was reading where he was comparing, where he was describing the biochemical nature of DNA. And I say, Lord God, you are such a genius. Yes. And I went into worship. Yes. All right. Okay. What was the, name again? the name of the book is Signature in the Cell. Signature. It's by Stephen Meyer, Stephen C. Meyer. He is uh, not a scientist, nor am I. But, but quite frankly, all you have to do is have a clear thinking head and a, and a curiosity and the ability to do research and you can communicate truth, which, which he does. All right, all right. Um, the one last video, this is a short one, it's called The Inner Life of the Cell. Cute little uh, theme. There, there is, um, what this is actually showing is a white blood cell that's flowing through an artery and it gets a signal that there is an infection nearby and it has to create proteins and it's got to transport the proteins uh, to the right place so that the it, structure of the white blood cell can flatten and it can go to the place of the infection. But you're not going to understand all of that. I just want you to look at all the different things that are going on. So if we could go to the inner life of the cell.
So, how do you get a protein to where it needs to be? You put it in a big bag and you have a little guy who walks along a roadway that has been constructed to take it where it needs to go. The amazing thing about what's going on in the cell is you have all this activity that's going on. It is self-regulating. It is self-directing. I mean, it is completely and totally self-contained. And they get excited because they find water on Mars as if life is just a matter of just adding water. This had to be designed. And this is why Anthony Flew suddenly was no longer an atheist, because he saw this. All right, let's go back to our telegraph. A working telegraph or protein making? See, I, I use the telegraph as a code for you to understand protein making. Okay? We're all code. Information is all code. You need a sending device. And that little thing that glums onto the DNA and starts zipping along it, creating the messenger RNA, that's the sending device. You need a receiving device, and that's the ribosome. That's the one that began reading the messenger RNA and started doing this three-step ratcheting like a computer tape process to build the protein. You need a means to transmit a sending action to the receiver, that's messenger RNA. You need power. Now, this is done by a popular molecule. It's all over the cell called adenosine triphosphate. And it is what gives the cell energy. And it's what provides all the motor stuff. And then you need the same code book on both sides. And this is the matching of the transfer RNA with the messenger RNA. God is telling us that he is there and that he has a mind that he is intelligent, his eternal attributes. We have a God who knows. You know the interesting thing when you, when you look at all of this? You go to the book of Genesis, and what does it say? And God said, code, information. Okay. Information is the bedrock. It is the, the fundamental bedrock of the universe. There's two ways of understanding the universe. And one of them has to be used to explain the other. Okay? The first way is it's stuff. I don't know what kind of proto stuff was there before the Big Bang, but it's just stuff. It's matter. And if the universe is just matter, then everything that we're looking at here is the product of random change, random permutations, this, that, and the other. And then somehow you have to explain the fact that we actually have minds, right? I mean, do you know, do you know how profound our mind is? Our minds pursue truth. Our minds know logic. You know, that is a phenomenal thing. And let me tell you that, that going from stuff to mind is a bridge too far. By, by leaps and leaps and leaps. On the other hand, if there is a God who is there, who speaks, who is an intelligent, and he says, let there be light, and now we, now we have a God who, through his energy, creates matter. But a matter, matter that has order, that has structure, that has laws, that points to him. It's amazing. Okay. So like, so like the log which became a god. Again, these videos were made by secular organizations. So they, these are people who've been piecing all of this together, and somehow or other, they're able to look at these and say, yeah, just add water. There, there is a lack of imagination that says, wait a second, how did this come to be? So that's like the log. So these, they are a significant challenge to the materialist worldview that these things just happened. But again, these point to an creating intelligence capable of designing the living cell 
That design required thousands of proteins to broker the functions of the cell. And this designer created codes for these proteins and the mechanism for their production and manufacture. And then let's, let me just talk about evolution. Very simply, a change in an organization requires a code change, requires change of information. And if you are going to go from species not so hot to species wonderful, you need new code. You need new information. Um, so evolution, if it exists at all, requires that the designer take it to the next level. Everything is designed because everything is based on information. And I invite you to do this. The next time you're in a newspaper article or a magazine article or you're listening to someone talk about evolution, you know, that evolution did this. Do you know that they always say that evolution did this, nature did this. Isn't evolution wonderful? Take out the word evolution, put the word God in there, and it makes sense. Because, see, what it is is that nobody who is espousing evolution actually thinks what it means for random change to work. They just have this notion that, I mean, it's like evolution is directing things. Can't be. By definition, by the definition of evolution, it is random change. And let me tell you what random change does. It tears things apart. It never makes things better. So anyway, I hope you, uh, this has been enjoyable for you. Thank you for, for your time.